My name is Laura. I run a security firm called SafeStack you've never heard of. Don't worry too much about that bit. Today, my job is to further my career by speaking at a conference. Isn't that good? My career ambition is by the time I'm 40, I want to have given everything that's in my head to other people. Because turns out this security thing doesn't really work when there's only like 20 weirdos in the world doing it. Uh, we have to try and convert all of you, like some kind of strange religion, into making your life more difficult and doing more to earn the same salary. So everyone on board? Good. Fantastic. So help me with my life goals today uh, and listen carefully. Now, I'm not just a consultant. I also make tea. Um, and I wrote a book. Well, I wrote a book with friends. Um, always do it with friends. It's very lonely on your own. My mom is very proud. Please don't buy the book necessarily because I wrote it. Um, I also built a product. Now, security companies are very rarely stupid enough to go and go, you know what would be fun? I'll build software as well as doing consultancy. This is a terrible idea. But between these two things, it means that all of the advice, all of the guidance, all of the random disconnected thoughts that appear in this talk today come from places where I've actually been knee deep in somebody else's code where we have tried and struggled and figured out these solutions ourselves. Now, things you should know, we're not perfect at all. We are 10 weirdos based in Auckland, New Zealand, um, who write code. And because we're relatively poor, our Kanban board is a window with some post-it post notes on it. And occasionally, they fall down because they're really cheap post-it notes. Um, that's our world. We're Python developers, but don't judge us. Um, I know you all speak .NET, and it seems like a very fun language. Um, I live and breathe security in software. Uh, that's probably, I feel like I just kind of confessed to a really terrible life choice. But how many of you have ever written software? Please raise your hand, because if not, you're at the wrong conference. Good, fantastic. How many of you are super awesomely proud of everything you've ever written? <laughs> Those two people, awesome. <laughs> There's always someone in the room, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm rocking this. How many of you have written code and put it on the internet that you know probably has issues? Yeah? Awesome, absolutely. Uh, me too. Now, this is a dream state, right? This world we're living in now, where you know it's all rainbows and uh, and, and kittens, and, and all of this code is working perfectly well uh, in this utopian state, and the hacking thing only happens to other people. Uh, that's, that's kind of what I've heard, especially in this hemisphere. But the truth is, that's not what's going on. What's going on is there is an increasing number of people attacking, and exploiting the applications we're building today, not because we're stupid not because we're malicious, not because we missed some kind of magic one step, but because security is really freaking hard. What we're saying is that you've got to protect every single person, every part of every system in your organization from bad people, from an undisclosed army of bad people that may or may not include a nation state. And you have to do this continually for the rest of your existence. Does this sound fun? Not really, because that's not why we became developers. We became developers because we wanted to build an awesome thing and see it work. And then we decided, you know, what would be fun? It's kind of cool. We wrote this software thing, and it took us a few months. Let's do it faster. Let's do it 10 times a day. Let's do it as continually as we humanly can. How many of you have caught DevOps? There is a cure, um, I have been told. It's a cream. Just apply daily. So we'll do it faster now. Won wonderful. So security, which was already hard and already expensive and already took a lot of time, we're now going to try and do that continuously too. Fantastic. Let's build the dream. Um, but that's the, the thing, right? I, I'm a bit tongue-in-cheek. You will note from already meeting me for these first few minutes, we're going to be friends, by the way, that I don't take security too seriously. It's a very big, very serious problem. But do you know what happens when security people take security really, really seriously? We all go and raise cows somewhere in like Northland in New Zealand. We go and open some kind of honey restaurant because you would go mad. If you don't see the beauty and the wonder in the software we're building, in the online worlds where we're teaching our children, in the self-driving cars that are going to revolutionize, if you hear the hype, how we drive and commute, 
to the scientific equipment that is either diagnosing cancer or is trying to answer questions about the universe. If you're not excited about software as a security person, you're in the wrong job because this is why we do it. How many of you are excited about what you work on every day? Okay. If you're not and you're sat in this room, you are literally the engineers of the future. You are the people building the new technology. There is no reason to sit in a job that bores you to tears because there are hundreds of other companies building amazing things. So how are we going to keep these amazing things safe? Well, I'm going to do two things in this talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about some common misconceptions and some principles we need to do to continually do security. And then I'm going to give my brain to you. And I'm going to go through for each stage of a standard life cycle. And I don't care whether you've caught DevOps, Kanban, Scrum. I do not care what religion or dogma you are following. Whatever stage you're at, I'm going to give you a whole raft of tools you can go and put into your life cycle today. How many of you would like to impress your boss? Fabulous. How many of you feel like getting a promotion or passing a performance review is an awesome thing, especially if you get a bonus? Wonderful. Top plan for you. I'm going to share these slides afterwards. You're more than welcome to wait till then. But I am giving you the list of all of the tools you need to weave security through a fast-paced life cycle. There are probably only 12 companies in this hemisphere doing this right now. So, top tip. I'm going to give you like the paint by numbers guide to doing this. If you choose to get promoted, that's your call. Right, other side thing. We have the strongest sticker game at NDC. Yeah, I am kind of arrogant about my stickers, but they are kick-ass. So if you stay to the end, if you ask a question, then you can come claim stickery prizes, because I know developers kind of like that. Well, who doesn't? They're stickers. Right, so common misconceptions. Firstly, it's not my job. We have a security team for that. Raise your hand if you have a security team. Keep your hand up if you know their names. Oh, wonderful. Are they here today? OK, right, can you see why we might have a problem? <laughs> these, these conferences are amazing. I've been sitting and learning about many wonderful things. And all of the security people who are supposed to be doing this with you are somewhere else, feeling angry and sad about the world. Um, our developer conferences and our security conferences are completely separate places. You'd think we were all kind of not able to play well together. You can play well with humans, right? Good. Well, in fact, the other problem is that on the attacker side, we have an undefined number of people going to do us harm. That includes all of you, by the way, so congratulations. Now, there's only a finite number of people defending, and that's called asymmetry. And wherever there's asymmetry, we have a problem. If you've got less people defending than we do attacking, you're always going to lose. Which means, as of today, congratulations, I've just kind of waved my LinkedIn wand up on you. And you can now say security professional on your LinkedIn profile. You should see the fun spam you're going to get. Next up, border devices will save us. How many of you have a web application firewall that is going to save you from the end of the internet? <coughs> yeah, some of you do. I know you do, because the vendors have been at you. I've seen the t-shirts and the swag around. Border devices do have an important role. I'm not here to talk about them today. Um, what I'm here to talk about is the code you build, because regardless of what vendor device you put in front of it, it's still going to be vulnerable. That's just how the internet works. So please don't go, well, you know, I bought a web application firewall, and therefore I don't need to care. Yeah, sorry, you do. It's impossible, so why try? Um, thankfully, this is a room of engineers, and you lot literally thrive off somebody saying, you can't do that. That's impossible. How many of you would then go, yeah, let me prove that to you? Yeah? Any of you been that jerk at 2 AM who's gone, yeah, I'll show you. I'm not going to sleep for three days, but I'm going to show you. Yeah. It is a really hard problem. For as long as there's been humans, we've been jerks to each other. If you had a shiny pebble and I didn't have a shiny pebble, I'm going to hit you with sticks until I get your shiny pebble. All we did was change the shiny pebble to be personally identifiable information and health records, and the stick to be, sadly, mainly pearl. Um, but <laughs> it's always been a hard problem. It's in your nature. It's in my nature. So we kind of have to do something about this. We've always done it this way, and it's never been hacked. How many of you think you've never been hacked? <laughs> it takes, on average, 287 days to go from being hacked to knowing you've been hacked. So even if you think you've never been hacked, chances are that you just don't know it yet. 
And do you know, fun fact, do you know like those ants where the little plant drops on their head and they grow a plant out of their head and then they eventually have a painful, cruciating death? Yeah. Oh, well, attackers actually are slightly symbiotic with their hosts on some occasions. And so you could have been hacked. They'll get in, clean up after themselves, patch a few things, kick out the other people who are already in your system, and kind of make themselves a cosy nest. That's nice of them, isn't it? Too little to fail. How many of you work for small companies, less than 100 people? Yeah? Yeah, I work for a 10-person company. We have more freaking security co controls than you know what to do with because we're a security firm, and that basically says kick me to attackers. It doesn't matter how small you are. None of the tools in here are going to cost you money. So you don't even get to wave your I've got no budget stick at me. I don't care. How many of you are compliance organizations? So HIPAA, FISMA, APRA. I, I can name buzzwords for days. PCI, DSS. Oof. Yeah? A lot of the time we say, well, we're compliant, therefore we must be secure, but that's not true. Compliance is kind of saying, yeah, I, I impressed an auditor and they were really happy with me. Um, but it isn't going to stop you being attacked. So what is continuous security? How are we going to do this? Let's get on with that, because that's why you're here, right? Not to talk about the world is screwed. We knew that. We want to know how we're going to do it. Now, full disclosure, Troy Hunt did an amazing talk earlier in the week about uh, OWASP type things. And you should just go read all of his stuff for like the rest of history of forever. This is not that talk. I'm going to assume you've been to that kind of talk. This is actually how you build a life cycle. So this is kind of the more of the how we build software, not the nuts and bolts of actually writing code. So as we should all know, software is built in a fairly standard way, dependent on you know, your team. But we get an idea. We do some design. We code some stuff. Hopefully, we do those in the right order. We test some stuff if we're being really super well behaved. And then we deploy it onto the internet. And good things happen. We all make oodles of money, and we're great. Now, traditionally, we put security in between these things. So every time you stop on your little cadence, uh, my part of the world jumps in and does something like a threat assessment or a code review. And raise your hand if you've been through one of these processes with an outsource firm, probably. Yeah? Bank employees, normally. Uh, yeah, definitely the finance people. And that's fine, kind of, if you have lots of money and lots of time. Because each one of these things takes time, right? Penetration tests might take two to three weeks. And if you're deploying 10 times a day, this isn't going to work. So how do we speed this up? Let's get on to that. Well, firstly, what we're doing is, dependent on where you are now, this is choose your own adventure. You could be at the absent stage of security, which is the YOLO ops version of, it's fine. My framework probably does this for me. PS, hackers don't even know exist. So we could be there. You could be ad hoc, so you know bits and pieces. So you know a bit about what Troy Hunt has been talking about. Maybe you read a blog post or two. And you're doing gentle things as you go along. You could be gated, so the more traditional way. So you've, you work for a bank or something, and they bring in things at certain stages and do it for you. Or you could be agile, you can be continuous. And that's where I'm trying to get you today. I'm trying to get you from wherever you start to the bottom of this list. So what are the principles of getting there? How are we going to get from ad hoc or absent right the way down to this. Well, here's the principles we're going to adhere to before I give you the tools. We want continuous security to be automated, autonomous, integrated, repeatable, and scalable. Now, lots and lots of buzzwords. Let's actually talk about what they mean. Automation is the best, best tool for most jobs when you're going fast. Humans are not good at scaling their own activities if they have to do them by hand and doing it manually. We're just terrible at it. Also, how many of you have a bit of your job you find boring? Yeah? The rest of you, you're super lucky. Like, you know, everyone has a bit of their job that is boring or tedious. Security jobs, I'm going to give you spoilers. They're not all exciting. You don't like gallivant around the internet looking for people in hoodies who might want to do you harm. You know, you're checking DNS records or you're checking vulnerability listings. These are kind of tedious. If you know your world is tedious and you don't want to do it, then create a robot that has to suffer through it for you. My uh, favorite mentor taught me that I was always going to have boring jobs if I didn't automate myself out. So here's the kinds of things you should be automating from a security point of view. Deployment, provisioning. Now, if you're looking at this and going, yeah, but I already do chef and stuff. Awesome, fabulous. You're already on your way. What you're talking about is tweaking what you already do, not inventing a new thing. Testing. How many of you do testing? 
And do you have a lovely team next door that you throw your testing at? Any of you? A couple of you? Yeah, it's all right. Be honest. I know how this works. Testing is a great thing to automate. I'm going to give you tools that you can go and do that tomorrow if you wanted to. If it's a Saturday, I don't recommend it. Static analysis, so going through your code and looking for common vulnerabilities. Vulnerability management, which is our way of saying you've got lots of holes in your space. You should at least know where they are, even if you can't patch them. After being automated, we need to be autonomous. So that means every single thing in your environment, every person in your coding environment, needs to be able to get on and do their thing. There needs to be no bottlenecks, no breakdowns, no ripples. There can't be a place where everything stops just because Bob has taken a holiday or because Mary hasn't shared her key with someone. It doesn't matter who you are or how long you've been there. You should be autonomous. How many of you have the word principal, senior, or some kind of management -y role? Like you're the grown-ups, yeah? OK. If you're the grown-up in your space, you might be used to being quite autonomous. But for the people who are younger in their career, so in the first couple of years, this will be quite scary. I'm actually a security person telling you to give your juniors autonomy. Let them go nuts. They're not going to go feral, I promise. But they need to be able to defend themselves and you. And they need to be your eyes, much like meerkats, really. Every team has to have those skills, the authority and autonomy, and the accountability to do stuff. If you have just one person in your team that does security, it will fail. Because that person, A, will be the most employable person on your team and will get snooped up by Google and go and live in some kind of Silicon Valley heaven. Or they will be so burnt out and stressed and tired that they're just not going to function, and then you're not going to have anything. So making everyone accountable is kind of like what we already do with UX a little bit and performance and scaling. These are just bits that developers have taken onto their existing lo load. So that's what I want you to do. It has to be integrated. I don't want you to have to go down the corridor, down the stairs, to the basement, to find the security team, to go and do the security thing, then come back to your desk. I don't want you to have to go to a new tool or a new dashboard. That's pointless. How many of you think you have extra time in the day to go check new tools? Yeah? No, didn't think so. If you do, there are plenty of people here recruiting for much more interesting jobs. We want security to be teensy tiny bits that are woven into everything. I want you to not even know it's there. I want it woven in so that you don't know it's there, but at the same time, I want it powerful enough that it can stop you, that it can stop your build. Now, stopping builds is not a good thing. I'm not saying security should stop your build all the time, but when we say no, we need it to be powerful enough that you listen. From integrated, we need to be repeatable. We need to do it the same way every time. How many of you have ever had that day where you kind of, you're driving to work and you've got your kid in the back of the car and the next minute you look around and their shoe is on the highway and they're giggling? Is that just me? Right, those days, you're not going to repeat your jobs in the same way you did the day before, where you'd had a very calm morning because the child was somewhere else. Repeating tasks when you have a life and other things in it it's really, really hard. So creating repeatable security things can be hard too. We want to make sure we do it the same way every time so that it's predictable. In fact, we want to work together while we're doing this. I want you working together with the security folk, with every technical bit of your organization to be like the best defense force known to man. It's kind of like Avengers, but less cliche ridden. Finally, scalable. Like I said earlier, we've got an asymmetric problem. There aren't enough security people. Now, if you want numbers on that, in New Zealand right now, there are 162 security professionals, according to our last census, 162. Of that, 35 are penetration testers. Now, if any of you work for CBA, you should be giggling slightly at this point, because I'm fairly certain you employ more penetration testers, or almost as many penetration testers, in your company as we do in our country. So give you some scale. We can't just throw more people at it. You can't hire for these roles. It takes on average eight months to fill a qualified security role, and you will keep your staff member less than two years. And that's depressing. So what we need to do is we need to take it from being some kind of crazy special where we've got a guru and a cape and a hat, and we need to turn it into every day. I'm, I'm about to tell you how to make it as boring and repeatable as possible so you never have to do it again. But that could be a good thing, because you want to focus on building that exciting technology we talked about. Now, if any of you are in environments where security is still in this blue sky kind of innovation space, please raise your hand. Any of you got that? Hi. 
Yeah, be very careful. Scaling out from blue sky innovation spaces, safe little laboratories is really hard because the world works differently there and nothing scales out into the complex mess of legacy code and systems and irritating personality types that is the rest of your organization. So are you ready to do the how to? Yeah, let's get going. What time are we on? We're doing well, we're doing okay. Let's start with design. Your code has to come from somewhere. I don't care about the process before where the business analysts and the marketers did their thing, you know, whatever. I'm going to give you tools that are for developers, for engineers. So we're going to start off with security personas. So if any of you have ever done behavior-driven development, which is kind of like the hugs and love part of UX, where we define our, our people and what they would look like and how they would interact with our systems, that's this, but kind of from a security perspective. So this is the idea that you can create a persona or a fake character that wants to do you harm. Now, how many of you have ever planned a bank robbery? Right, OK, well, first bit of homework. Don't actually go through with it. That's kind of crime. And inciting people to do crime is also illegal. So, um, But let's start creating some personas. Now, I don't know where you come from. You come from different organizations all over the place. But your security personas are going to be really vital because they give us three things. They tell us about the motivation of the person who's going to attack us. So you know, why on earth are they going to get out of bed? I'll give you a spoiler. Nobody gets out of bed and goes, you know what, today's the day I do SQL injection and it's going to be exciting. Nobody does that. Like, when we attack, and I say we, I mean you too, because we do attack. We just don't think of it that way. When we attack, we do it for a reason. I'll come back to that. We look at the resources of our persona. So are they rich? Are they poor? Do they have lots of tech uh, stuff? Or are they just largely throwing it together from sticky back plastic and a little bit of blue tack? Do they have access to things like buildings and resources? And do they have skill, finally? So how many of you have ever coded via Stack Overflow? Yeah, that's all of you. Uh huh. Um, that's not. There's no shame in that. But knowing the ability of your attacker, knowing whether they can do everything themselves or whether they have to look something up, is important. That's going to tell you the sophistication of what they're about to do. So let's talk a little bit about that motivation part. So there's financial, right? I like money. You like money. Let's get more money. It's quite straightforward. Personal. I think you're an idiot and I don't like you very much, and I don't want to do my life without causing you pain. Mm -hmm. Really nice, fun things. Or, I love you. You're awesome. I want you to give me all your attention. Creepy, right? Don't do that. Egotistical. I'm amazing, and you should know it. How many of you have ever written code just to show off? Uh-huh, the attackers do it too. Political. You really, really, really like fidget spinners. I really despise fidget spinners. I think they're an abomination to mankind and that they're the destruction of our planet in plastic form. It doesn't matter whether the politics makes sense, by the way. It just matters that I care deeply about an issue, that you have an opposite standpoint, and we're going to do something about this. I'm going to try and prove my point. Now, if we dig into one of those, let's look at money. So financial motivation. That gives us clues about how they're going to attack us, right? This is where robbing a bank comes in. So we can steal actual money. How many of you are sat next to someone you do not know? Not many. You very carefully positioned yourself. It's quite adorable. It's like little. Well, you've been in a crowded space with a whole ton of people. How many of you have had your wallet stolen yet? Probably. Really? For real? Here? Oh, goodness me. Like, guy at the back's like. I'm like, oh my goodness, we need to have a talk to the conference people. We can steal money, but you haven't done that. You know, stealing money is actually fairly rare in an environment like this. Stealing things to sell for money. How many of you have a shiny, brand spanky new laptop with you? Or a smartphone that probably cost $1,000? Yeah. Tablet PCs. Sneakers that are like weird, limited edition, rare things. Like the sneaker game here is really strong. You just go look at people's feet. Corporate espionage. If you don't want to steal things, you could just do espionage. That sounds fun, right? Or extortion. OK, less fun. But motivation really, really changes the types of attacks we're looking at. We're not looking straightforward as, I'm going to take your database and just take the payment details that are in there. It could be any number of things we're trying to do. Insider trading. How many of you work for publicly traded companies? 
yeah, knowing what's going on inside your company could actually be my motivation because I want to drop some interesting knowledge on the market. Now, when we're coming up with these personas, excuse the fact this is a male Lego figure, uh, I'm an equal opportunities criminal. Uh, everyone of every type can be a criminal. So please don't gender or otherwise categorize your attackers. But you give them a name, you give them a narrative, you give them motivation and objectives, you give them a skill level, and you give them resources. And once you've got all that, you write attack plans for them. So this becomes a really useful tool. You can use this to look at your architecture and go, well, what would these people do? What are they going to try and achieve? Why does this meet with their motivations? And it gives you a little framework to think about it in. If you work with UX designers, you can also work with them to make sure that users are shepherded towards secure behaviors to start with rather than at the end. They can also drive your testing. Linking back to our bank robbery, the, my favorite usage of them is linking with threat assessment. So threat assessment is the idea that we look at our architecture, whether that's drawn on a piece of paper on a whiteboard or it's some god awful PDF diagram of clouds, doesn't matter which scale you're on. But we can look at it in a consistent way and look for common threats. Now this is Stride, which is a Microsoft threat modeling system. But there are many others out there. It's free of charge. You can go and find the documents and the tools and things for it. It gives us a way of looking at things like spoofing and tampering, so pretending to be someone else messing with data. Repudiation, which is the ability to trace an activity to someone else in your system. Information disclosure, denial of service, and escalation of privilege in a structured way. Now, don't forget, it's not as simple as you think. Denial of service, for example, is my favorite one. Denial of service. We're used to thinking, you know, the Internet of Things is attacking us all at once, and so we fall over because too much demand, right? Did you know there's two other categories of denial of service that nobody ever talks about? This cascading failure denial of service, which links very closely to a lot of the resilience talks that have been here at NDC, where when a component you're using fails and a cascading failure then happens throughout your architecture. And then the third type is uh, a developer-driven denial of service, which is... Uh, my tongue-in-cheek name for when we write crap code, it makes it through to a production environment and we kill it. How many of you have ever denied service to your own application through bad code? Uh-huh. Rest of you, good luck. Your time is coming. So security personas and threat modeling give us tools to understand who's going to attack us and why and how they're going to do it. Now, if we're armed with that, we can start planning the controls and putting it into our design. Now... <clears throat> Let's talk, about, oh, let's talk about the design part. Now, I will update the previous slide. I'm skipping over the ones with links on, um, in that case, because the link is broken. So I'm going to send you a new version when I link the slides out. So let's talk about the code. We've got our design. We've got our security po personas that are fed into stories. We've got our threat assessment, which has given us extra thought for when we're padding out or grooming our requirements. So how do we turn this into code? There's three things I want to talk about very briefly. I want to talk about peer review, linters, static analysis. Now. How many of you peer review code? Yep, OK. So the general rules of peer review apply for security as well as your stuff. So giant peer reviews of giant changes to code should just be sent to the C. And the developer in charge should be told to just do it again, but do it smaller. You know, the more code you're trying to review, the more likely you are to not spot any of the issues in it. Same with security. Now, if you're looking for some structure on how to do security code review, because that's hard, then I suggest you check this all out, the OWASP, Open Web Application Security Project, Application Security Verification Standard. There is a link in the notes. Now, that is a documented almost book of how to validate security in your own software. It's written for developers specifically. The newest version came out just late last year, and it's actively maintained. So you can download that, and you can get going. And this should be done every story, every sprint, every developer, every single time. Now, that might mean that you've got a bit of upskilling to do across your team, or it might be that you do build your own linters for some of these common things. Like, why don't you engineer your own solutions? You're actually software developers. When I write code, it looks like a hacker wrote code. When you write code, it actually works. If you want some more ideas of things that you can look for and check, this is the standard security stories. These are published by an organization called Safe Code um, in a wonderful PDF they put out a few uh, a few years ago now, in fact, but still very, very relevant. They give you 20 standard security stories you can put into JIRA templates if you do the JIRA thing or whatever your ticketing system is, 
And when you see something like, my thing has to open a socket, my thing has to be an API, my thing has to connect to a database, it gives you the security requirements that you need to check. Which means when you're doing your peer review, you have a predefined set of security things that aren't required in you to go and manually write this out for yourself. Okay? Two things you can just go and do straight away. Awesome. Okay, those are the links to it. You can get going straight away. I'm going to wait because that night Lacey is taking. Oh, look at your wee cameras. I am going to give you the slides and you can click the links and not type them. Wow. Okay. So let's talk about testing next. Now I know testing isn't sexy. Well, I think it's kind of sexy, but I'm a bit weird. Um, test, ooh, ooh, electric shock, yay. Um, testing is fundamental. Now, whether you do basic unit tests or whether your, your place is more of a manual exploration kind of testing kind of ideal, it doesn't matter. There's a couple of things I can show you that you can get going today in that testing phase and bring automated things into a continuous security environment. So I'm gonna talk you through the links on these, but. Remember, the principle behind this is you built the code. If you are the developer, it is your ugly baby. It is your responsibility. Don't just throw it over the fence to a security tester. Take care of the basics first. And the basics are not hard to test for. You can write really reusable tests for this, or you can use a vulnerability scanner that would do the same thing. Now, to get you started, now there's a wonderful um, lady from New Zealand called Katrina. She's all over the Twitters, um, and you can get her Twitter handle from her blog there. And in 2015, she wrote The Pathway to Security Testing. And it is a glorious blog post that takes you step by step through all of the steps you want to go through to become a security-minded tester. Now, even if you're a developer and you only do this as part of your role, this is useful. And if you're a developer and you're going, that's no, not really my circus, I'm betting you know a tester who would quite like that. And guess who's not at this conference? Testers. Do you not find it really interesting that a community decided that it was a really good idea to divide ourselves into tribes and then never talk to each other? Hmm. Right. Gauntlet and BDD security. So Gauntlet and BDD security are automated test frameworks for security. You can go nuts and do that today. I have a short talk slot today, otherwise I'd demonstrate this for you. Um, but it's written in Cucumber. You can just put it into your thing, write your tests, off you go. Same kind of style testing you're probably doing already if you're automated. And finally, OWASP again. They've written an OWASP testing guide, which is an entire book on this. And if you saw my Twitter yesterday, they also yesterday launched the mobile testing guide. So if any of you are writing mobile applications, these are the security things you want to go look at. If you want to drive your security requirements, go look what the testers are looking for. Build. So we have done our design. We have done our coding. We've done some testing. We're now into build. Now, it doesn't matter if this is a daily cycle or every three weeks. Don't care. Let's do what we can do at build time. Your pre-flight checks, so your build process, are the way of finding those security internet issues before the internet does. Uh, outsourcing finding security issues to the internet is a fairly variable process with different results. Um, I don't know about you, but I like being employed. And if your company end up all over the internet because they get somebody else finding their security vulnerabilities and going public with it, then you're probably going to have a bit of a bad time. Now, the, I'm going to give you a bit of guidance and I'm going to talk you through the two tools that we've got for you here. Um, adding things to your build cycle is actually really, really difficult. You can do entire talks on this. Most people are very sad when their build suddenly goes from three minutes to 24 hours. Dependency checkers and some of the build integrations you can do, such as vulnerability assessment, will take a very long time. So you may actually find for your environment, if you are continuous like three times a day, or if you haven't got the time to really tune down these processes to only do the bit you really need, then you might be better doing it in parallel rather than in line at this point. Okay, so that's something I learned the hard way when we suddenly realized that our build time had shot up. Um, and for us, we couldn't scale it any other way than to do parallel. So please bear that in mind. So things you can do, if you're an open source developer, and if you do open source, well, that makes me sad too. Go do open source, they need your help. Um, you can use libraries.io. If you have budget, they, you can pay them a very small amount of money and they can pay you for it. Um, or OWASP Dependency Checker is another one. Uh, OWASP Dependency Checker and Libraries.io do the same thing. They're checking all of your libraries and frameworks for uh, pre-existing vulnerabilities in code. So if you're using an outdated version of X, Y, or Z library, then it's going to tell you, how many of you actively go and check that already? 
Good for you. I can always tell because they're always the ones in the hoodies. <laughs> if you're not, please remember, and I do use this analogy a lot, so for those of you who are silly enough to come see me talk more than once, um, remember every single component, every technology you bring into your life cycle is a puppy. Puppies are fun at parties and we like having them, but puppies poop. These are your vulnerabilities. When you bring in many, now I've got clients who use hundreds of cloud services, they use dozens of libraries. If you know that's you, remember each one of those is a puppy and you do not want to be the person who is manually shoveling the waste at the end of that. So look after what you have, check your dependencies at build time and stop your build if you're using out of date software. How many of you know you're using out of date stuff and are just going YOLO? How many of you have justified it because you're like, it's deep inside my architecture and nobody could possibly reach it? I will give you my favorite example of why we don't sometimes care. And that there's a, there's a reprobate on the internet called Tavis Ormandy. He's not really a reprobate, he's quite lovely. Um, but he likes destroying software. And he finds glorious bugs. And he finds them not in the external layers, but by passing things through the layers and getting them trusted at some weird deep bit of the stack. So it's almost like blind exploitation of systems. He's done this with Fitbit scales, with antivirus. Um, remember, if you're interesting enough, if there is a motivation strong enough, someone will find a way to get to that awful, obscure part of your stack. Or they'll just work around it and attack your people, whichever you prefer. Managing your dependencies is not just a nice to have, it's really, really important. There's entire ecosystems, and we're going to come to that just shortly, of people actively trying to find vulnerabilities all the time. And the more common the component you're using, the more likely it is a vulnerability will be found. How many of you use Node? Any Node developers? Oh, that's good. You're still admitting it. That's great. Fantastic. Um, Node is a fantastic example of why maturity levels vary in language. So if you're a .NET developer and you're sat there going, yeah, I'm .NET, I'm cool, NuGet's got my back, you're probably right. There's more in NuGet than there is most other package managers at this point. But if you're in a heterogeneous technical environment, that's a really rubbish term, isn't it? It means one where you've got lots of different technologies. Then it could be that not all of your technologies are managing their packages as securely as the core language you're using. Node, for example, has absolutely no checks on what's in those packages, none at all. You can enter a, a library into the NPM repository with the name of a system call, and it will be accepted. You can then wait for people to try and call your library, your system call library, and do what you like with it. There are some wonderful demonstrations out there if you really want to understand. The other thing with Node that makes this interesting and is relevant to .NET too, is remember the more densely connected your components are, so the more commonly used your libraries are, the better the target is. So if everything ends up at OpenSSL originally, so that's why we see so many vulnerabilities come through in SSL, because, well, everyone's using it. Let's talk about deployment. That's our build, deploy, slightly related, slightly separate. Validate regularly and measure. Now, another thing you should go look at, the DevOps Defensive Toolkit. Again, huge. these are huge documents. I could do you a talk on each one of these on their own, but I get one talk, so you get homework. So this is written by Gene Kim and a few other people. So if you've read the Phoenix Project and all those kind of things, same people. Go read it. This is your Survival 101 guide for getting through security audits in a DevOps environment. Um, really great thing. We've got SSL Labs by Qualys, which will give you free validation of your SSL configuration if you're interested in it. Alternatively, there's a command line tool called SSLIs. Uh, Docker, benchmark, uh, Docker Security Benchmark if you are containerized and want to validate your configuration for deployment there. Remember, again, with Docker, they do not validate the images in the Docker repos. So if you're using a pre-configured one, please go and check that, because sometimes they come with pre-open ports or configurations. Um, that final link is a terrible AWS link, but that's how they've chosen to link it. Um, and that is valid as of this morning. That will get you to that defensive security uh, audit toolkit. Phew, how many of you are going, oh my god, I didn't come to a talk for homework. This is ridiculous. There's like 17 things to try. Yeah, it's okay, you can rant on the internet later. Um, send all of your, your, your feedback to Troy Hunt. Um, okay, maintain and monitor. So we've got our code out there, we've done our design, we've done our coding, we've done our testing, we've done our deployment and build. Hopefully it was all green and we all went live. Fantastic. How many of you then go home and go, yep, my work here is done? 
Any of you got an ops team that then look after it for you? Like the code babysitters? Uh -huh. Reality check, those days are coming to an end. If they're not for you yet, they will. Um, it's increasingly becoming the case that you will have to maintain and look after your code until it dies a fiery death on a server. So bear that in mind. You need to know bits about incident response, about monitoring, about responsible disclosure. Because it turns out while your ops teams are fantastic, they're not here either. They don't know how your code works or what a microservice architecture is, or what sharding is. They have no freaking clue about any of this stuff you're about to foist into their environment. They know how to look for common patterns and to set alerts and that kind of thing, and they're fantastic. They're very good at the infrastructure layer and the installed application layer, but for your stuff, the best people defend the code you wrote is you. Now, what happens when your company gets the, you know, Dear company name email, I found a copy of your database on the internet. Do you like Bitcoin? I like Bitcoin. Now, I don't know about you, have any of you received an email like this? We've had 27 of them in the last three months. I know that because we have a managed program for it. There are people who make their entire living and their entire career off doing this, and that's great. Um, we want a world where we're finding vulnerabilities and aggressively fixing them. That's a good thing. But if you're not prepared for this, then it gets really scary really quickly. How many of you have a plan for what you would do? Any of you using bug bounty programs? Ah, so that's the easiest way. If you have budget, we'll spend. Go talk to Bug Crowd or Hacker One or whatever. They'll take care of your problems and send you probably a T-shirt. But for the rest of us, we have to do it the gloriously old-fashioned way, which starts with reading an ISO standard. Um, there are some really wonderful resources out there about doing this, but the key thing is, if you're going to get an email like this, you need to have templated out your responses. You need to know who you've got to tell in your company. How many of you think your boss would freak out if you received an email like this and then you told them? If you don't think that's going to happen, please go try it when you get back, just for science. I do like science. It's really terrifying to get an email like this. What does this actually look like? There's a word for this in, in criminal law. Extortion. Extortion, absolutely. We're coming back full circle to our motivations from earlier. This is indistinguishable from blackmail and extortion because it normally comes with the promise that if we don't hear from you, we're going to go public with it, which to a publicly traded company could be material that could affect the value of your company. So being prepared for this is a really tight line. You're going to sit with engineers and people like yourselves will be like, yeah, YOLO, we'll write an email, it'll be fine. We'll give them a PGP and off we go. PGP encryption key. And you're going to sit in a room with a lawyer and that lawyer's going to need a hug by the end of it. So please prepare for this. The future of software security isn't just writing secure code because security changes over time. Even once your code is deployed, chances are new vulnerabilities will be discovered. It's also about then surviving if a bad thing happens. How many of you do incident response? How many of you do it for security? Yeah, not many. It's fun. When you sit in a room and you practice incidents, you learn a lot. You learn a lot about yourself. You learn a lot about your company. It's really fun if you sit in an environment and you go, well, I think we've been hacked and we need to check the access logs. And you're doing a simulation and you go, yeah, everyone check the access logs. And you go look at the access logs and you find out you've got access logs for 14 minutes because somebody misconfigured a server and after 14 minutes they roll over and you lose everything. That's a really good time to find that out because if somebody comes to you because an instance reached the software team they need to investigate, they don't want that answer. They don't want you to turn around and go, hey, can't really investigate. Turns out we had an oopsie with a log file. So incident response simulation, even in a dev team, is really important. What would you do if somebody dropped all the tables in your database? Easy, restore from backup, because you all have backups, right? Yes. What would you do if they did a minute change to a record in your database every 27 minutes for the last six months? That's really hard to unpick. In fact, your backups aren't going to help you much either because most of us don't have the length of backups to go back far enough to say when it started. We can't roll back to a period of time because it's been happening too long. We can't spend the manpower to surgically then iterate over the records. And in fact, what if those little changes had ripple effects through the logic of the system? Anyone think this sounds fun? 
I think it sounds amazingly fun. If it doesn't sound fun, find the fun in it. Because it's much more fun to do this as a simulation than it is to do it for real. I promise you. Again, the lawyers really don't like you when you sit there and go, I think it's going to take me about six months if I write a script. Like, then you've got to know what your answer is going to be. And you may not like the answer, but it's important you know. Preparing for incidents is kind of natural. You will have all heard by now somebody from Netflix talk about the Simeon Army. So uh, their suite of tools that will take down a data center or they will take down a piece of code to see if they're resilient. This is what you need to be. You need to be the chaos monkeys for your own organization. How many of you were affected by the AWS outage recently? It's OK, I've asked that to an Azure using room. I know that. Yeah, or sat there feeling smug and going, ha ha, Azure. Um, if you were affected, we were affected. You start to get a very, very good feeling of how vulnerable you are to security incidents happening in other people's companies. Um, if somebody is denial of service and you're coupled to them in some way, then you're going to want to care about that. Now, there was a wonderful talk at Code Mania in 2015 by a guy called Josh Rob. He talked about coupling and connaissance in software. Um, if you haven't checked it out, you should. Um, now, that talks about the dangers of keeping our software too tightly together. Nobody ever talks about that from a security perspective of what happens when we're so tightly coupled to these outsourced and third party components. Components that may go bankrupt overnight. There's been several high profile startups that went from all is good, all is good, to disappeared off the internet within a week in the last six months. If you're not sure what they look like, go look at Crunchbase and figure that out. We've got companies that got merged or acquired and suddenly stopped so supporting services. We've got the biggest denial of service attack in history against Akamai last year, which was at its peak, giving over 675 gigabits a second of data. Um, even the best of us in this room cannot write code that can sustain against 675 gigabits per second of traffic. This is what we call a get a cup of tea and wait situation. Turn it off, go home, come back when it's over. So your instant response, your planning, that is your future. Writing code is awesome. It's fantastic. We can go really fast when we do it now. But to do that safely, to do that securely, means tweaking and introducing a lot of extra things into your life cycles that aren't already there. It means freeing up yourself to think like a bad person. Think about who's going to do you harm and why they'd want to do it. You know, the biggest risk to your organization remains you, the insiders within it. I'd love for you to go back to your world. Now, don't do this publicly and certainly don't tell your boss. But go and figure out all of the ways you'd defraud your company. How would you do harm to it right now? Because if you can't figure that out, if you can't figure out with your access right now how your software would fail, it doesn't matter then. Nothing else will win. So the tricks of continuous security, we want it to be scalable. We want it to be autonomous. We want it to have things integrated through. I've given you all the principles you need. I've given you a whole raft of tools you can go and try. Now, the trick to this is you don't need to try all of them. If you do just a few things, you're doing way better than everyone else out there. Uh, I did a talk earlier in the week, and you can catch the video, and I gave you the four things that small company startups would do. Now, if you're doing those four things and these things, you're pretty much golden. Those four things were managing your passwords and accounts, privilege of, uh, principle of least privilege, or application whitelisting. Uh, not the same thing if anyone sat there going, they're not the same thing. No, they're not, but they're joined. Updating your applications, updating your operating system. If you're doing those, plus the stuff in here, you've got the most modern security approach on the planet. And if you're sat there going, yeah, but that sounds really rubbish and there's still more work to do and it's not perfect, then here's my challenge to you. The world of continuous security, the world of security for software developers is not going to be written by people like me. It's going to be written by people like you who are engineers, who can figure out how to bring this into your world and share it and scale it with tooling or approaches. So please take everything that I've given you today, go run with it, and in six months' time, come back to me and tell me what you did and how you changed it and why it's better than when I told you, what didn't work that I told you. If you have any questions, you are more than welcome to ask them. Um, I do have stickers. That's not a bribe, but you know it does make things a little bit more interesting. Um, if not, it's been genuinely lovely to talk to you today. And I'll be doing Ask Me Anything this afternoon. You can come check that out. Or if you're coming to PubConf, I will be talking about the Nihilist's Guide to Cyber, which is a slightly different approach to security. Any questions? Where can we find the slides? 
you can find me on the Twitters. That's the easiest way to do it, and I'll do it today. Now, if you are finding me on the Twitters, and I get fed up of giving this brief, but I have to, lady underscore nerd. The other lady nerd without the underscore is not me, and she doesn't do security or care about computers, and she doesn't want to be your friend. So if you do come to find me, either email me or find me on Twitters, but get the right person, because it gets a bit embarrassing and she gets cross. Uh, if you do email, though, my inbox is a nest of dragons, so you're going to have to fight for survival. Animated GIFs get you further than most things. <laughs> no questions? Oh, hello. Um, so there was a tool in OS which called Zeta Dark Proxy. Yep. Does that tool kind of help with uh, this sort of uh, yep. security uh, Absolutely. Um, so when we talked about test here, Gauntlet and BDD security, so um, the question was, how does OWASP ZAP, which is an application vulnerability attack proxy, essentially, how does that work in a continuous pipeline? Does that work? Um, that tool is, is a really great starting point. It's free of charge. You can download and get going today. It comes with the following caveats. It's a Java tool, which means you're going to lump a whole ton of Java in your environment. If you're not Java shop already, somebody's going to cry. It's got the worst UX known to man because it's a swing app. But BDD security and Gauntlet, the two that are up there, so BDD particularly can wrap around Zap in headless mode, so you don't have to use the awful UX, and you can then write automated tests from it. Running a full scan with something like Zap or any of the other vulnerability scanners is fantastic, and please consider it in your pipeline. The reason I don't mention it at length is it takes a long time to run one of those scans, and the amount of false positives you get is high, so don't just run the full app scan consider doing something like BDD security where you're targeting particular types of vulnerabilities rather than just YOLO anything that goes. Or do the, the once-off scan on a local environment first. Any other questions? No, enjoy your lives. The day star is that way. Um, um, bye. <laughs>